title of this talk is really uh, uh, um, it shows that the the, the um, library is will will happen elsewhere, so it is really outside. And uh, to today we have Andres um, Söderberg. He is head of the publishing, di 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 uh, the digitization and metadata management at the Stockholm University. Thank you. I hope this works. I, I'm standing here happy to have the perfect slot of the day, I think, after the coffee break, but still uh, a long time before lunch. So I think I'll have everyone's attention for 30 minutes. And um, those 30 minutes, I will spend talking first about the, the main title of my presentation, The Library Happens Elsewhere, which I think is a really clever title. Uh, I was really happy myself when I came up with it. And and then I will talk about the subtitle of this presentation, which is not on this slide, but it is um, in the programs, Using and Adapting Library Workflows for Stockholm University Press. And Stockholm University Press is the main um, uh, new mission, the new thing we are working with at Stockholm University Library, and I will come back with that. And then I will finally say something about the future and maybe something about uh, library strategy and how this affects our strategies. But let's start with um, with a title. The library happens elsewhere. So let's start at the actual library. Um, this is the long hall at the Library of Trinity College in Ireland. And I choose this image not for any other reason than that this is a really beautiful library. It was built in the early 18th century, and I think they added a second floor of books in uh, the mid 19th century. And, and as beautiful as this is, and as great collections as they have, this was actually in the 17th century also a way of uh, reducing the total cost of ownership for uh, information resources at the university. Um, because, as you all know, the printed books are, even if you can print them, you could do that in the 17th century or the end of the 18th century, they, uh, they are not so easily copied, they are quite heavy, and it's economically feasible to store them in one place. And then when you have a university and you have researchers, they need to access information, and you store that in a centrally located facility, and the researcher comes walking to the library, and they read and study and research, and then maybe they walk home to get some sleep and then walk back to the library again. So these libraries were not built to be beautiful, but to be cost efficient. Uh, and there is, it's a direct line from this thinking of building the library as the place to go to, to find information, to um, uh, discovery systems. Stockholm University are proud customers of uh, the EBSCO discovery solution, which is perceived as the way to find all the information resources that the library makes available for you. Um, exactly the same kind of thinking as was relevant in the 18th century. You go to the library, you find your information, you, you read it, you work with it. Uh, and why not? But on the other hand, why? Is this the future of libraries, or is it not? The library of Utrecht um, decided not to, uh, to purchase a discovery solution. And these graphs, I don't think you can read the text. I don't think you can read the link to the, the blog post where they come from. Uh, but what they're really showing is that the, the users aren't coming to the library. So why should the library try to bring the users to the library? Why not, why not work with um, or start with an idea that students and researchers are elsewhere. And for, I think, the past six years, we have been using the phrase, discovery happens elsewhere. But what actually happens is that the library happens elsewhere. You don't use uh, foreign discovery services to access resources located at the library, but you actually find information resources that are stored in other places than the library. And if you perceive the library as a collection of resources, the relevant collections are probably found in, in places li like uh, Mendeley or um, other environments where the researchers actually collect the resources that are relevant to them. And this is a quite, 
quite a fundamental change for how we look at libraries. And we probably haven't thought enough about what this means to us. But one person who has, and you saw him earlier today, and if you were here on Tuesday, you also learned that he has a really long title. It's Lucas Koster from the University of Amsterdam. This is also from a blog post uh, where Lucas asks the question, is there a future for academic libraries? And says, and I hope you're still, uh, you're still standing for this. Uh, personally, I think in the near future, we will see the end of the academic library as we know it. Um, and, and I agree, that's, that's quite possible. I actually hope it will happen, because I think there are other things we uh, need to do. But looking at the academic library, and, and starting from the idea that we have a collection of resources and we make students and, re and researchers come to the library to access those resources, um, we also do some other things that might have been perceived as side businesses for us. Many libraries at smaller and larger universities have been, been doing some publishing. Uh, we have uh, maybe had some involvement with uh, taking care of uh, ACTA series for the universities, handling some ISBNs, uh, doing some administration. So, apart from all these really important things, we store and collect and, and, and describe the universe of information for you, we also do some publishing. And if you take all those other things away, this is what, we're, what remains. So this is, this is the other idea for this presentation on the library happens elsewhere. Uh, what happens to the library if the actual library happens elsewhere? What should we do with what we have left? What happens if we focus on, on the things that has not been our core business for 5,000 years? Um, this graph, if you were at ELAG in 2011, you have seen it because I used this exact graph. It's the cost of acquisitions at Swedish research libraries 2002 to 2009. And as you can see, the really interesting uh, intersection of, of the cost for digital content and print content. In, in 2003, libraries spent uh, about 50% of their acquisitions budgets on uh, electronic, 50% on print. And then print uh, is going downward, and it's sort of flattening, a flattening out, and I think it will sink in a few more years. But digital usage, uh, cost for digital content is still going up. So this is the kind of graph you show to an audience when you want to say that uh, we really should reconsider what we are doing. Maybe we should work less with uh, moving around the print collections and more with uh, electronic collections. Or maybe you should look at what other things happened in 2003. For example, the Stockholm University in 2003 decided to uh, launch an institutional repository. And, and we became part of the Swedish DIVA consortia for institutional repositories. This is, um, well, so, some universities had been a, a little bit ahead of us there, some were a little bit afterwards, but the big shift, the big um, year when um, we started looking into um, publication databases, institutional repositories was 2003, the same year as um, we saw the decline of print. Uh, in 2003, the National Library of Sweden launched um, a quite big project called um, Svensk Elektronisk Publicering, Swedish Electronic Publishing, to, to uh, sort of research what is happening here and, and um, what kinds of infrastructures need to be built to handle electronic publishing. And the report from this project in 2005 says that uh, Electronic publishing gives great opportunities for a faster and broader spread of the works of researchers and students. Uh, well, duh, we can say today. It's quite obvious. But as a rule, libraries have more or less pronounced responsibility to coordinate these efforts in cooperation with the researchers and students. So, 10 years ago, we could actually see that um, uh, we have a new area of responsibility. 
and I'd be happy to see the library that 10 years ago had not only drawn the conclusion that uh, we should work more with, we, we should actually um, um, prioritize where our staff resources go in the same percentage as our acquisitions costs go, but maybe you should look at the cost for acquisitions of, of electronic content and then focus that amount of staffing on uh, publishing services. Because that's I, uh, where I think we are heading in this electronic environment. Uh, in 2007, the Stockholm University, or the vice chancellor of Stockholm University, mandated that every researcher should um, record or register their publications in the, the Stockholm University uh, publication database. And if possible, they should also uh, deposit an electronic version of, of that uh, uh, article or, or book. And that's something we have been using um, for six years as the sort of foundation of, of what we have been doing with publishing support at Stockholm University Library. But in 2002, uh, the 20th of December, we had a new, um, new decision by the vi vice chancellor to, to actually, um, um, this is a decision, it's in Swedish, and um, the subject of this decision is coordination of uh, publishing services at Stockholm University. And um, the decision is the vice chancellor decides according to the suggestions from the report, which the university has spent over half a year preparing, looking at what kind of support do the Stockholm University need for publishing. Uh, not only is it about working with the metadata in the repository, evaluating research, etc., but to actually strengthen the, the publishing efforts for the university. And we saw it as a validation of the work we had been done for six years, or hour for 10 years, and also as a, a good Christmas present, but as a, as a challenge, because it, it means that we not only do we have to deliver something here, we actually have to deliver more than the university asks for because they don't really know. The researchers know what they do when they research. They know a lot about, about their publishing environments. But in this decision, we also see from the vice chancellor that the university regards the library as the institution at the university which has knowledge and skill in publishing infrastructure. Lucas Koster, once again, in his blog post in January 2013, called this the final frontier, the library turning 180 degrees and switching from consumption to production of publications. And according to some people, which Lucas uh, provide links to, uh, university libraries are very suitable and qualified to become scholarly publishers. Lucas himself is a bit hesitant here because publishing as it currently exists requi requires a number of specific skills that have nothing to do with librarian expertise. Uh, but of course, the publishing, publishing process can and probably will change. Uh, sounds reasonable. This is the part of the library happens elsewhere. Now I enter the world of, of uh, or rather the roads to Stockholm University Press. If this is a decision that we were happy with half a year ago, it was because we had worked for it and we had made other services we thought were good. Two of them I will describe today, though I think there are more. And one is um, the project for digitization at Stockholm University Library, which we started in 2011. And in 2011, digitization was a new thing for us. We hadn't done anything there before that year. And we are not very big on special collections, but what we have is uh, the university output, the research output from um, the late 19th century and onwards. So that's what we focused on. We started a project to digitize all the dissertations from um, 
held the first dissertation from the Stockholm University in 1906 up until 1960, where there was a big change and the Stockholm University actually became university and, and uh, increased their research output. And when doing that, we also made some decisions on sort of key principles for how to work with digitization. And the first thing we decided was that we didn't want to make a new silo for digitized books. We didn't want a, a special system for the digital collections, but we wanted to build on existing systems and existing workflows, which meant building on the library catalog and the library or the institutional repository, and then add functionality when needed. We were kind of inspired by the microservices approach to uh, digital repositories described by the University of California Creation Center. But while they are way more advanced than us, we just took the approach, looked at what kind of services do we have, which can be used for this, uh, this kind of work, and what do we need to add. And the only thing we needed to add was, um, and this is a, a very fancy name, a file system-based object store. Because we couldn't store the raw TIFF files or from the, the scanned pages in the repository. And we needed a, a, a better archive for as, as a backend for the digitization. And then we, we uh, thought of it as building with Lego bricks, have this sort of modular infrastructure where we have we have a catalog. Why have another catalog for digiti digitized uh, content? We have a repository. Why have a repos another repository for um, digital digitized content when the big problem we have is that these, these two systems don't communicate as well as they should? So we started working with that. This is the first digitized book, the, the first dissertation from Stockholm University. Studien über Sydamerikanische Termiten um, by Nils Holmgren. Tomorrow is the 107th anniversary of his dissertation, actually. And, and this is um, the record in the institutional repository, and this is the record in Libris, the, Nat the Swedish Union catalog, which we use for cataloging and which, is, which we regard as our actual catalog. This is where we do our work, this is where we import data, this is where we want to export data. So, what were the issues here? Well, one of them was syncing data between repository and catalog. I think Peter van Bohemen talked a bit about this yesterday, because there are different kinds of data stored in the repository and the catalog, and we had to do some manual work here and some manual work there, and, and we had to wait a night before um, data from the repository was imported into the catalog, etc. And it was frustrating, but we uh, came up with workflows that made this work for us. And we also had an identifier problem, where we didn't want to mint new identifiers if not necessary. So we started using the Libris identifiers as identifiers in our um, object store, uh, which worked but was frustrating. So now we are migrating to, to our own minted identifiers and then making relationships between them and the Libris IDs and the IDs used in, in Diva and possibly some others. The second road to Stockholm University Press was the Stockholm University ACTA series, which the library had been responsible for in handing out ISBNs, um, chairing the, the committee making decisions for publications in the ACTA series. And in 2011, this was, as we perceived it, sort of a, if not a dying business, so at least a declining business. There were some people at the university really interested in using this, but most people weren't. They thought it was kind of old-fashioned, and uh, why should we publish something in the uh, ACTA series? Why not use a real publisher, or maybe just uh, publish it ourselves at the, the institution? So we made some changes. 1956 was the year it started. 2011 was the year the ACTA committee decided on an open access policy for ACTA publications, and also to prioritize electronic publishing, to actually um, declare that the open access electronic version of this, uh, this publication is the main thing here, 
then we can use a print-on-demand service to make it available as physical copies. So in 2012, we started using, uh, or we switched from uh, storing books at the um, book storage facility to uh, using print-on-demand for the Acta series. And in May 2012, we launched a new sort of online store where you could, if you didn't want to go to the actual booksellers or, or bookselling portals to buy the book, you could purchase them using a credit card directly from us. And in autumn 2012, we started digitizing the entire backlist on of about 1,500 publications. Uh, so this is a dissertation in law by Åsa Romsson, who is also um, a spokesperson for the Swedish Green Party. A and and uh, this is her dissertation in um, the repository and in Libris. We actually use the same workflows here as we developed for our digitization project. And we added some more issues to work with here. We still had the, the issue of, of syncing data between repository and catalog. We had to work with identifiers. We also had to, to find a, a good way to send uh, files to the printing house we're using, because they, they really sucked at keeping track of, of the, the PDFs they used for print. So we had to make them available in, in, in a, an easy and coherent way, which we couldn't do from the repository because it wasn't built for uh, communicating files to a printing house. We also ran into some serious ISBN problems. And I don't know, I think you are aware that ISBNs for, for electronic books is a mess and that it isn't working. Uh, and for all my professional lives, I have hated the publishers for not doing this right and thought that if I ever become a publisher, I will do this right. But I, today I feel um, deep sympathy for the publishers. I know why they are not doing this right. We still try to do it right, which meant we had to talk a lot to the National Library about ISBN handling. We had to have some policy changes for the union catalog. But we are able to um, handle ISBNs correctly. Uh, and we also ran into the issue, Lucas, well, you didn't warn us about it because you wrote this after we had actually started working with it. But we realized that publishing requires skills that we didn't have. We are very good at, at standards and metadata and things like that, but we are not so good at editing. We uh, don't know that much about the publishing business. So we uh, had to hire, um, well, today we have two professional editors. Last year we had one. Uh, and we also quite naively thought that if we digitize the entire backlist, we can uh, print it on demand, and suddenly everything is available print again. But that was not as easy as we thought. So our, we still have a project for doing that. And the real irony of 2012, uh, the ACTA committee made a decision to prioritize electronic publishing. And we spent the entire year working on the print on demand service and, and having that functional. And, and that's, it feels kind of ironic, because we had to think a lot about print last year. Uh, and now, we are in 2013, and we should develop Stockholm University Press, which will be based on the same workflows as we developed for our digitization project and for the ACTA um, reorganization. And we uh, have some key principles guiding us here as well. We don't want this to be an, an organizational silo in the library organization. We want to build on library workflows and, and to, uh, to integrate it into the other workflows we have, the other ways we support publishing at the university. We uh, have to, um, somehow this has to affect how we catalog books, how we uh, purchase books, how we think about this entire ecosystem. So we don't want to have a little publishing department uh, at the side of the university library. We want this to sort of infiltrate the library. Uh, and we want to build on existing systems and workflows and add extra things if we uh, need to, which means that we have to have this sort of, of Lego uh, modularity way of thinking. So this is not new for us. We are, are tackling this the same way we tackle digitization. The current projects we are working with now is to take care of all Stockholm University dissertations, which we 
it can never be mandated because the Stockholm University is very distributed and, and the actual researchers can always say, or the PhD students, that I want to publish somewhere else. But we will develop a workflow for everyone who don't want to think about that. I think this is something a lot of universities have. Um, at Stockholm University it was a mess. It will not be, we hope, as painful for the PhD students to uh, finalize their uh, dissertations. Or at least they won't have to think about contacting the printing houses and, and making sure the dissertation follow the graphical guidelines, etc. We are also working with turning digitized backlist into electronic text, which is what we realized we needed to do if we were, if it should be possible to make usable print on demand copies for them. So we are working with um, an external contractor for that to send our scan pages and get real marked up electronic text back, which we in the future will use to. Um, uh, publish EPUB instead of uh, PDF files, or we will probably publish both PDFs and EPUB, which will uh, deepen our ISBN problem, uh, because we still want to follow the guidelines, because we are obviously librarians. Uh, we are also, we are part of today a, a Swedish project financed by the National Library, the Swedish Research Council, and Riksbanken's Jubileumsfond, which is a, a big private founder of, of research in Sweden for um, a, a peer review for open access monographs. A and the ideas from that project we will use into actually coming up with a peer review system for Stockholm University Press to um, support especially the humanities scholars which um, are mandated to publish open access but think this is very difficult because there is no um, open access humanities publisher in Sweden. We need to improve dissemination. We need to move from e uh, PDF to EPUB, which means that we need to have a sort of, of XML-based storage for, for everything. We um, shouldn't store the unmarked or poorly marked up PDFs. We, we need to have a true electronic text as a basis for everything we do. And I'm happy you said that I could use a few more minutes, Rurik, because now my half hour is uh, over and I still need to say something about future. Uh, I'm sure at least some of you are available with the concept of disruptive innovation, which was um, uh, popularized by Clayton Christensen in 1997 in his book, uh, The Innovator's Dilemma. A and, and Christensen contrasts the disruptive innovation, which is the so someone or somewhere someone comes up with a new idea which sort of rewrites the rules for everything. And usually this is done at first um, targeting people who are not consumers of, of, of another uh, company's products, uh, but actually suddenly sees that this is something I can use, or, or maybe they do something not as good as the previous um, uh, producers have done but you do it much cheaper, and then the poor people decides that uh, I will do this cheap thing instead of the expensive thing. And eventually everyone realizes that, well, this cheap thing was obvious, obviously the thing to do. And he contrasts this with sustaining innovation, which is not bad at all, but it's the way of, of, of enhancing the things that you're already working with, uh, making sure that we have competition on the market to develop the best services, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, and the problem here is that if you are uh, an established business, you have to work with sustaining innovation, which means that disruptive innovation becomes very difficult for you because that actually means disrupt disrupting the very foundation for, for what you're doing, uh, which is difficult if you have to make money. You have to be very farsighted to, to do this. Uh, this, the main disruptive innovation, it, it's quite easily targeted over the past 20, 25 years, is, is the web, which sort of disrupts every business, I business it comes into contact with. Uh, and it has disrupted the music business, it has disrupted the uh, video, uh, movies, and it's uh, disrupting libraries. So the panic response to, to these disruptions is um, to say something like this. Libraries need a next generation platform that is generic, scalable, multi-tenant, and able to meet all user expectations. 
while keeping total cost of ownership to a minimum. The new digital environment is mobile. Therefore, we need an extensible modular fr framework which will leverage the cloud by outsourcing delivery of enhanced mark records. We think of this as a unified virtual index with RESTful APIs embedded in a federated structure of linked open data. And I'd just like to ask, is Ajax still cool? And with this, uh, I, I declare myself the winner of the ELAG 2013 bullshit bingo. <laughs> but I'd also like to say that there's, there's, there, there's some truth in, in, in here, <laughs> actually. It's just impossible to work with, and, and, and these, I mean, really. Uh, but don't worry. Clayton Christensen to the rescue. Only a week ago, he, he launched a new concept, which will keep him uh, a very expensive uh, talker at business conferences for the coming 10 years. Hybrid innovation, which includes both the old and new technology. And, and the problem with, uh, with um, sustaining innovation and disruptive innovation is that if you have a market where, where you actually have customers who demand things from you, you can't disrupt your own customers. Um, you can't target your non-customers if everyone is using the same systems. So in a hybrid inv innovation environment, and, and he also has, of course, lots of, of, of examples of this, and the main examples when launching this uh, concept is uh, education. We are actually trying to work with, with the principles of, of, of the new technology, the new, the new value system, the new, the new way of doing things, but still fulfilling the needs of, of our, our current customers, uh, which is uh, difficult because it's not cheaper at all. You still need to have all the expertise you had earlier. But on the other hand, you can make a transition, and you, you, you might not go, go down into the dustbins of history, and you don't have to panic. And, and this is how, how we see Stockholm University Press, actually, as a way to work with a new infrastructure for publishing. To, because as a, a library serving, well, 60,000 students and 5,000 researchers, we can't just say, well, oh, research objects is obviously the thing to do. Let's quit everything else and do research objects. We have to deliver the things we might not see as the future of our business. So we, we regard Stockholm University Press as sort of hybrid um, innovation, where, which we can use to, to turn the entire library around and learn new things. And looking at the bigger picture, um, there are other things we need to work with. We need to look at the research evaluation, what's happening with the CRIS systems, how is the entire ecosystem working. But we have sort of a practical business to work with. We, we have it mandated from the university and the vice chancellor, and it's working pretty well. And that's it for today. Thank you. Uh, I think there is uh, only uh, 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 some, se some uh, 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 seconds left for one question. So is there one question? Because uh, we have a warm lunch, and if we have too, too many questions, then we have a cold lunch. No questions, then we go to the next speaker.